Joining us now on the line from Washington, D.C., P.W. Singer. He is director of the 21st Century Defense Initiative at the Brookings Institution and the author of Wired for War. And Peter, we're glad to have you on the line from Washington. How are you tonight? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Glad to hear it. I want to just start with a very general question about uh, where the idea of using robots in conflict in the first place would have come from. Oh my gosh, the idea of um, using machines to do our dirty work for us, it, it dates back both to um, you know, even Greek mythology, but definitely in the realm of science fiction. But it becomes something real, really, um, as technology starts to advance uh, in World War II. The Germans, for example, invent things like uh, cruise missiles, the um, famous uh, V-1, and then the V-2 bombers with, um, uh, that they sent across as rockets. And then you start to see some dabbling in this field during the Vietnam War, for example, and then the Israelis using it in their war in Lebanon in the 80s. But it finally becomes reality in the late 90s and then in the Afghanistan conflict when the technology finally catches up to the ambition of what we wanted to do with the um, technology in war. And let's make a distinction here between, say, a robot that, as you put it, does your dirty work for you, and an unmanned, remotely operated gizmo of some kind. Do you want to make that distinction for us? Well, really what we're talking about is a continuum along the same line. So, for example, um, the U.S. Air Force, it describes its um, predator fleet uh, as remotely piloted vehicle. The very same systems that the U.S. Army flies, they call them unmanned aerial systems. Other people call them drones. Other people call them robotic planes. Really what you're talking about is a plane in which the person, the human, is not inside of it. Now, the amount of control that that human has over that plane um, depends on the technology as well as the amount of um, leash that you give it, that you allow it to carry out its role. So, for example, the first generation of predators were almost completely human controlled. The human may not have been inside of the plane. They were on the ground even 7,000 miles away, but they were co controlling every aspect of it. But the very next version of the Predator, the Reaper, for example, can take off and land on its own. It can fly um, waypoints using GPS on its own. It can even identify targets on the ground on its own. For example, it's smart enough that if it sees footprints in a field, it's smart enough to know that it might want to backtrack those footprints. So there's a distinction between having the human inside the plane or not versus the kind of roles that you might give it. Really what we're talking about here, though, is the robotization of technology as we're starting to move humans out of the old meaning of, of going to war. That is, we're at war with these machines, but we're physically not inside of them. And that creates all sorts of big legal, ethical, moral, even just military doctrine questions. And we will get into those as we continue our conversation. But I, I, I just want to get a better understanding of the proliferation of these things. Because I remember when, uh, you know, the Gulf War under George Herbert Walker Bush, Norman Schwarzkopf, Colin Powell, that group, uh, my recollection is there were no drones used in that war. Now we're up to, what, potentially thousands, if not tens of thousands? Have I got that ramped up properly? We've seen this massive growth. I think you've got it exactly right. Um, let's look at the, not the first Iraq war, so to speak, in 91, but the second Iraq war in 2003. Um, the invasion force that went in there had a handful of these unmanned aerial systems uh, with it. We now, the U.S. military has over 7,000 of these systems in its inventory. On the ground, the invasion force utilized zero unmanned ground vehicles, ground robotics. It now has over 12,000. And these trend lines, that's where we're at right now, they're just continuing to grow. So um, the U.S., for example, I was talking with a U.S. Air Force three-star general, and he said, you know, very soon it's not going to be thousands of robots. It's going to be tens of thousands. And it's not just the U.S. Um, there's 44 other nations that are building, buying, and using military robotics, including, for example, Canada, that um, for, has reached an um, agreement with some Israeli companies where it's leasing the operation of unmanned aerial systems in its own military operations abroad. Well, here's again, what I think we need to better is, understand, Peter, and that is, you know, what's changed? Because I think I read in your piece that once upon a time, the people who made these things couldn't even get their telephone calls returned from people at the Pentagon, and now all of a sudden they're going out and being told, just make them. Make thousands of them, make as many as you can, get them to us as fast as possible. What changed? The attitude towards them, and I, and I think that that example you give is a very powerful one. Right now, there's not a single aerospace company 
in the United States or Canada that's working on research and development of a military combat aircraft that has a plan for a human pilot inside. All of the systems that they're working on, that they're envisioning for the future in the research and development stage right now, are unmanned. So that tells you where we're headed very soon. Um, what changed is the attitude towards these technologies combined with the technology getting much better. So um, these systems, uh, they used to be not seen as all that useful. Um, no one wanted to operate them in war. The companies couldn't even get their phone calls returned, as you, you mentioned. And now we're seeing them proliferate. And they're particularly adept at um, roles that they call uh, dirty, um, uh, dangerous, or dull, the three Ds. And the idea of this is that um, uh, can you keep your eyes open for 20 hours at a time watching Afghan desert and mountains? You may not be able to do that. A robot can. Can you operate in a, a dangerous environment um, in terms of the dirtiness of that environment at night in a dust storm, in a chemical or biological weapons environment? You may not be able to. A robot can. And then, of course, there's the other aspect of danger, which is um, what the troops in the field particularly talk about with these systems. Is I remember talking with a um, military officer who was using a ground robotic system to um, go after these roadside bombs, these IEDs. And he was saying, I like having this system because I don't have to worry about writing a condolence letter to someone's mother. And that's mm -hmm. the impact of these robotics on our wars, because it's, it's not just how we're using them tactically in the field, it's the way that changes the political decision making around war. Let me get some sense from you as to whether or not you think this is as historic a game changer in the prosecution of wars as say the discovery of gunpowder or the discovery of the first machine gun or the discovery of uh, you know the ability to you know put a plane in the sky and drop bombs from that. Is it are we talking that big a game changer here? I think we may be, we are at least we're at the early stage of a, of a parallel like. Um, when you go meet with the folks in the military, um, they make the parallel if they're in the Air Force to we're at with robotics right now, roughly around 1918, where we were with the um, airplane. And what's interesting about that is that, you know, we may think of something like the Predator drone or the Global Hawk as really exciting, really science fiction. But in their parallel, you know, it's the first generation. It's the, the biplane with canvas wings. It, it's, we haven't seen what we can do with these systems. Um, Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, makes a different comparison. He describes how he sees robots right now, the robotics industry, as being where the computer industry was around 1980. And again, it's an interesting parallel, because if you go back to 1980 with computers, they were these big, bulky devices. Uh, they couldn't do a lot of functions, and the military was the main spender on both the research and development as well as the main client in the industry. And of course, we learn more and more things that we can do with these things that we call computers, and we you know, have them in our cars now, we have them in our planes, we have them in our kitchens called microwave ovens. Um, we're using computers in all sorts of ways that we don't even call them computers anymore. And of course, that same aspect of computers leads to all of these tough questions. No one back in 1980 said, oh, the computer is going to create questions of law. The computer is going to create questions of privacy. Well, let's follow up on the ethics of this, because you touched on it earlier, and that's obviously an important angle in this whole thing. How does the military decide when the mission is right to send a body into, and when the mission is better able to be handled by something unmanned, robotic, a drone, call it what you will? It's a, it's a really great issue that you're bringing up there, and it, and it cuts to the heart of the problem, is that we're at the early stage of this technology. You know, again, if the parallel is you know, the World War I stage of this, we haven't yet figured out all the answers to these kind of questions. We don't have yet what we call a doctrine, a plan, a system, an organization for how you put it all together. And I was talking with a um, young U.S. Air Force captain out in the Middle East, and um, the way he described it is he said, quote, it's not let's think this better, it's only give me more. And that's a really powerful statement when you pull back and think about it because you know just a couple years ago, the military didn't want the system and now it's give me more. You know, the Canadian military wasn't even thinking about buying or using these systems. Now it's saying we need a budget for them. Uh, the US Air Force and US Army used to not want them, now they're fighting over who gets to control them. But the problem 
is, and the way you get to success with these systems is the let's think it better part of it. And that's the stage we're, we're about to enter into right now. Peter, in our last couple of minutes here, I want to touch on one more thing, and that is the psychology of the whole thing. If you are a pilot and you are actually there in the theater of war, dropping bombs on people or on military installations, you can see what you actually do. And presumably, <clears throat> an expert in the field can tell you that it has some kind of psychological impact on the person doing that fighting. Is the psychological impact of sitting in Tampa, Florida and moving a joystick and dropping a bomb on somebody 6,000 miles away different? It's interesting. Um, when I was doing interviews for my book, uh, there was um, two folks that actually had the same exact quote, roughly, and they said, um, anything that makes it easier to kill is not necessarily a good thing. Mm -hmm. And what was striking about both of these individuals coming to that conclusion is that one was a U.S. military special operations soldier. He was a sniper um, who was just back from Afghanistan, and he was saying anything that makes it easier to kill is not necessarily a good thing. The other person in a different interview that said roughly the same exact thing was an individual with Human Rights Watch. Um, and so these two people with very different perspectives were coming from to the same conclusion. And so I think that's what we need to keep in mind about this technology and what it enables. Now what's interesting though is I think that describes more our broader political attitudes towards it. When you drill down to the individual experience of the pilot, of the operator, we're discovering something that's very different. We're discovering, for example, that among these units that are operating out of, um, for example, air bases in Nevada, but they're flying planes that are actually over Afghanistan, those remote warriors' levels of combat stress and fatigue in some situations are actually as high, or even in some cases higher, than they are for units physically in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's because of some subtle differences. Um, one is the whole idea that the, the human body, the human mind, the human psychology may not be set up to do this kind of fighting from afar. Another is that they actually may be seen more of the trauma of war than, for example, a bomber plane pilot would have been in the old sense. In the old days, a bomber plane pilot would fly into the target, drop the bombs, fly away. They might be in this point of danger, seeing what was happening for just a few br brief seconds, and they wouldn't have a close-up view of it. The operator of a predator may be over that target, seeing it up close for hours. Then they drop the missile, and then they see what happens afterwards with a high-powered camera. And then an important aspect of it, right after that moment, they can step outside and they'll be in Nevada. So they've been engaging in war, and then they're in a nation that really fundamentally isn't fighting a war. And so there's a disconnect they talk about of how strange it is to be killing enemy combatants, and then as one of them put it, 20 minutes later um, driving home and being at the dinner table and talking to your kids about their homework. Let me ask you one last thing about one person in particular, and that's the Commander-in-Chief. Given this uptick that you've told us about, do you think that in future the decision on whether to go to war will now be easier because you're not talking about uh, thousands of people coming home in body bags. You're talking about sending machines out to do what people used to do. I think we're already seeing that trend well before we get to you know a, a world of machines doing everything. And the, the way I view it is that it's the there are certain trends that were happening in our democracies and our societies already, and now we're adding technology to them. That is, in almost every Western democracy right now, we no longer have a draft. We no longer have conscription. Um, we no longer declare war. For example, the last time the United States declared war was 1941. We no longer buy war bonds or pay war taxes. And so the traditional connections between a citizenry and its wars is being changed. The barriers to war, so to speak, have been lowered. And now we have this technology that allows you to carry out acts of war without having to worry as much about the political consequences of it, mm -hmm. without having to worry as much about the, um, uh, what plays out when that condolence letter goes to some mother or father and, and how the media reports it. And so the way I think about it is the barriers to war, they were already lowering, and now we have a technology that literally takes those barriers to the ground.
And again, it, it, it's not just a theoretic um, you know, issue that we're talking about here. I think we're actually seeing it play out right now in the operations um, in Pakistan, where by the raw numbers, we've carried out almost six times the number of airstrikes there with unmanned bombers as we did with manned bombers during the Kosovo War just a decade ago. But notice we don't call it the Pakistan War. We didn't have a debate about it in our Congress or our parliaments. You've raised some fascinating and provocative questions there, Peter. Thank you so much for joining us on TVO tonight. We appreciate your time. Thanks for having me.